Last week we talked about demons and what they are. And according to Jesus, demons are disembodied spirits, which means they can't be fallen angels. Why? Because angels have bodies. So what are demons and where do they come from? Well, as I told you last week, there are three theories as to what demons are. The first theory is that demons are fallen angels. But I've already explained why they can't be fallen angels, why that can't be true. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45, that demons are disembodied spirits. But angels have bodies. So according to Jesus, demons can't be fallen angels. So even though this first theory is the most popular, it's wrong. And I don't care who teaches that. John Piper says that demons are fallen angels. Norman Geisler says that demons are fallen angels. The problem with that is they haven't studied what Jesus had to say about demons. And Jesus spoke more about demons than anyone else in the Bible. So if you're going to do an exhaustive study on demons, then you're going to have to study what Jesus had to say about demons. And Jesus said demons are disembodied spirits, which means they can't be fallen angels. The second theory is that demons are the disembodied spirits of a pre-Adamic race. But as I said last week, there aren't any scriptures to support that. So it's difficult to prove. It might be true. I don't know. Maybe it is. But there's no supporting evidence to hang your hat on. It's just a theory. The third theory is that demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim that died during the flood. Now, as I said last week, this theory not only has scriptural support, but it's also what the Jews believed at the time of Jesus. In fact, the common Hebrew word for demons at the time of Christ was Tamu Nephal. And Tamu Nephal literally means dead Nephilim. And that's what the Jews believed at the time of Christ. They believed that demons were the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim that died during the flood. Now, last week I gave you some cold, hard facts concerning demons. First of all, demons vary in wickedness and in power. In other words, they're not all the same. And there are different types of demons. As you read through the Bible and you study more in depth, you'll find out that there are familiar spirits. That's a specific type of demonic spirit. There are unclean spirits. Believe it or not, that's not a synonym. That's a specific type. There are devils, plural, not referring to Lucifer, but demons. That's a specific type, and you can go on down the list. Secondly, demons seek to oppress people and to entice people to sin, and if possible, to possess a person's body. Why? Because they're disembodied spirits. And Jesus told us that when they're cast out of a person, they go through a dry, arid place. It's very uncomfortable for them. And so the first thing that they do is they go back to that body, and if it's cleaned out and swept in but it's not occupied, they get seven more wicked than themselves to inhabit that person's body. Why do they do that? Why do they get seven more wicked and more evil? Because they got cast out the first time, and they want to make sure they don't get cast out again. I also explained that we can do certain things that opens the door to demons and demonic activity. Things like the worship of other gods and idols, involvement in occultism, drugs, pornography, and any type of perverted sexual sin. I'm talking about transgenderism, bestiality, homosexuality. Let me explain something to you. Those are all linked to demons. Jesus always referred to them as unclean spirits if you go a, bit, a little bit deeper in the Greek it literally means filthy perverted so there are different types of spirits and those type of sins are linked to perverted perverted demons now those are the most common ways of opening a door to demons or demonic activity but they are not the only ways there are other ways of opening the door and remember the more often you open the door the more access they have to your life in fact, let me show you a very interesting scripture. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 26, verse number 2. This is one of those verses that if I were you, I would highlight it in my Bible. Notice what it says. Like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse. An undeserved curse will not land on its intended victim. So there are two types of curses. There are curses that are deserved, and there are curses that are undeserved. 
Curses that are deserved have a place to land. Curses that are undeserved don't have a place to land. Now listen to me. When we do things that we shouldn't be doing, we open the door to not only sin and to demons and or demon, demonic activity, but we also open the door to curses. And we deserve what we get because we open the door. It is an open invitation to them. They cannot force them, themselves into your life. But they can if you give them an open invitation. In fact, let me give you another verse that goes along with this verse. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 10, verse 23. It says, doing wrong is fun for fools. Now, I'm going to repeat that because some of you are fools. Why? Because you enjoy doing things that are wrong. Listen to this. Doing wrong is fun for a fool. But living wisely brings pleasure to the sensible. In other words, it's fun to do things that we shouldn't be doing until we realize that we've opened the door to sin, to demons, demonic activity, and curses. People, then it's no longer fun. You see, there's always a price to pay for not listening to God and doing the things that he tells us we shouldn't be doing. There's always a price to pay. Now, what are you supposed to do with this information? In other words, is this just interesting? You know, we were getting ready to kick off Corners. Actually, it was every one Sunday where we tell everyone to invite one. And we always try to come up with some type of series that people will be interested in. Last year, it was heaven. Now, to be honest with you, I didn't think it would be that popular. And so I said, well, I could teach on heaven. And I'm just throwing things out there. And everyone on staff said, oh, teach on heaven, teach on heaven. People want to know about heaven. And I, I didn't realize that. So I taught on heaven. It's very popular. This year, we're trying to think, how do we kick off the year? It's every one Sunday. What series should we do? And I said, well, everyone liked heaven. What if I teach on angels and demons? And everyone will say, oh, yeah, yeah, teach on angels and demons. And I really don't understand what's going to, pop, going to be popular and what's not going to be popular. You know, I never really know that. Sometimes I teach on something that I think, oh, boy, everyone's going to like this. And I'm telling you, attendance dwindles down. Everyone's like, <gasps> And then other things I think, boy, that's not going to be popular at all. And people are like, I love that series. Well, you know, I said angels and demons just kind of threw it out there. And everyone said, yeah, let's do it. That's really interesting. So let me ask you this. What are we supposed to do with this information? I've been teaching for five weeks on this subject. So what do you do with it? Is it just interesting? Or are we supposed to do something with it? Well, if you would, turn with me to a scripture that tells us what to do, how to do it, and why we need to do it. The what, how, and why. And that passage of scripture is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Verse 10 tells us what to do. Verse 11 tells us how to do it. And verse 12 tells us why we need to do it. So follow along with me as I read this passage of scripture. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, the majority of people, they read through this and they think, man, that sounds very religious. And it was probably put in there just so it sounds good. People, it's not put in there because it sounds good. It's put in there because it's very important. According to this pastor of scripture, what we need to do is to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And how we do that is by putting on the whole armor of God. And why do we need to do that? Well, verse 12 tells us it's because we're fighting with evil forces in the spiritual realm. In fact, Paul says that we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. Instead, we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then in verses 13 through 18, Paul talks about each piece of armor and its purpose. But this morning, we're not going to focus on the armor of God. Not yet. That's in the coming weeks. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on verses 10 through 12, and we're going to start with verse 10. And the reason we're going to focus on these three verses is because if you don't understand these three verses, you don't understand the importance of the armor of God. Most of you are getting whipped in the spiritual, spiritual realm. You have no idea what to do with the spiritual weapons that God has given you. But the reason you don't is because you don't understand these three verses. So let's start with verse number 10. Notice what it says. Finally, finally, in conclusion, this is something you really need to know. 
my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, I want you to underline the word strong. Strong is translated from the Greek word endunemao. Endunemao. Say that fast ten times. But more importantly, it's written in the passive voice, which means that the strength or the power that he wants us to have doesn't come from inside of us, but it comes from an outside source. And then he tells us who that outside source is. He says, be strong in the Lord. So the strength of the power that Paul wants us to have doesn't come from within us. It comes from the Lord. You see the phrase, in the Lord, is written in the locative of sphere case, which means the location that it's coming from is not you, it's Jesus. The truth is, you don't have enough strength inside of you to fight what's going to come against you. Why? Because it's spiritual. But people, that's okay. Because Jesus does. You just have to be strong in the Lord. If you don't think that you have enough physical strength to go on, that's okay. Jesus does. If you don't think that you can overcome what you're going through, that's okay. Jesus can. If you think that you're going to fall by the wayside because you just can't do it, that's okay. Jesus can do it for you. All Paul is telling you to do is to be strong in the Lord. Let his strength empower you and then Paul takes it a step further because he wants to make sure that you understand what he's talking about look at the last part of verse number 10 finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might now the last part of this verse is just a further explanation of what Paul meant by be strong in the Lord you see the word and is translated from the Greek word chi and it's used as an ep exegetical conjunction which simply means that the last part of this verse is meant to clarify what Paul was talking about when he said, be strong in the Lord. Now let me explain a little bit about the Bible. 99% of the Bible you can understand without a knowledge of Greek or Hebrew. You really don't have to understand what it is in the Greek or what it is in the Hebrew. I bring it up many times because it really gives you a greater understanding. But 99% of the time, you can just read the Bible in English and you can understand what it means. But there is 1% of the verses that you can't do that. If you don't know Greek or you don't know Hebrew, then you won't be able to understand it. So as I'm reading through this in Ephesians 6.10, because my minor is in New Testament Greek, and it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, and, and I see this word, and, it's chi, I know that it's an ep exegetical conjunction. Which means that this last part is going to clarify what Paul meant when he said, be strong in the Lord. So I go, oh, okay, this is a further explanation. What does he mean by that? So now that you know that, I want you to underline the words power and might. Power is translated from the Greek word kratos, and it always refers to supernatural power. Always. Not human physical power but supernatural power. Might is translated from the Greek word iskus, and it denotes inherent strength or the power that a person possesses. And in this case, it's referring to the power that Jesus possesses. So what this is saying is that you need to be strong, but not in your own power. You need to be strong in the supernatural power of Jesus. This is not talking about physical power. It's not talking about eating right, getting enough sleep, and exercising. It's talking about being strong with supernatural power. And how do you do that? How? Well, Paul tells us in verse 11. Remember, in verse 10, Paul told us what to do. Be strong in the Lord. Not in your power, but in the supernatural power of Jesus. And then in verse 11, he tells us how to do that. And in verse 12, he tells us why we need to do that. So look at verse number 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So this is how to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You put on the whole armor of God. In other words, when you have the whole armor of God on, you're strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. When you don't have the whole armor of God on, then you're not strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It's as simple as that. In fact, think of it like this. The armor of God gives you supernatural power. When it's on, you're strong in the Lord and the power of his might. When it's off, you're a weak, frail, mortal 
human being. It's kind of like an Iron Man suit. How many of you like Marvel comic book movies? You like Spider-Man, you like the Hulk, you like the Fantastic Four, you liked Iron Man, Captain America. Well, you're weird. I don't like them. And I know I'm not weird, right? My, my wife and my children, they love those things. So every time they come in or come on, then, you know, they want to go to them. And I go because I like being with my family. But I have to be honest with you. Oh, I hate them. But anyways, if you've gone to Iron Man, you know that Robert Downing Jr., you know, he's just a normal guy. But he's an engineer. So he created this suit. And when he puts this suit on, it gives him supernatural strength. It gives him the ability to fly. And he has all of these powerful weapons. I mean, he can take a blow and it throws him back, but somehow it cushions him. So he is this supernatural person with this suit. But people, I want you to understand something. There's really something that's like that. And it's called the armor of God. The armor of God is like an Iron Man suit. When it's on, you're strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. When it's off, you're not strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You are just a frail, weak human being. So if I was to ask you, how do you become strong in the Lord and in the power of his might? What would you say? Well, I'll tell you what you should say. You should say, in order to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, you have to put on the whole armor of God. Because the strength of the Lord is directly connected to the armor of God. When it's on, you're strong. When it's off, you're not. Now, according to Paul, once you put on the armor of God, you are able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Look at verse number 11 again, and I want you to underline the word stand in your Bible. Notice what it says. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, the word stand is translated from the Greek word histami. And in this context, it means to hold firm and not be pushed around. Or, in other words, to withstand an assault or an attack. Because actually, this is a military term. And it literally means to hold your ground and then mount a counterattack. So it's more than just being defensive. It also means going on the offensive and counterattacking. In fact, let me go a little bit further. Here's why many of you are not successful in life, and, and it's why you're always having problems. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse number 12, that from the, time of G, from the time of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. How many of you remember that verse, Matthew 11, 12? You remember that verse? Now, why did he say from the time of John the Baptist until now? Because the purpose of John the Baptist was to prepare the way for Jesus, the Messiah. So when he came, he ushered in a new dispensation. He ushered in the dispensation of the Messiah. And the devil realized when John the Baptist began doing that, the Messiah was on the earth. In fact, the way they knew Jesus was the Messiah is because he was alive spiritually. Whenever the demons looked at a person, they knew that they weren't the Messiah. Because the Holy Spirit did not dwell within them. Everyone had the Adamic nature. And the Holy Spirit could come upon a person in the Old Testament, but a Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit never lived inside a person in the Old Testament. Of course, today the Holy Spirit lives inside of us when we become saved. So when the devil sees that, demons see that, they know whether you're saved or you're not. If the Holy Spirit's not living inside of you, you're not saved, and the demons understand that. They see that. But when Jesus came on this earth, they saw a man that was filled with the Spirit of God, filled with the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just coming upon him, it was living inside of him, and they knew he was the Messiah. And at that point, Satan and his demons began revving up the attacks. So Jesus comes along, and he says, from the time of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffereth violence. In other words, they're getting whipped. And the violent take it by force. Now, if you have the NIV, it says something totally different. It says from the time of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing and the violent take it by force. So you have to ask yourself this question. Which is it? Is it the King James Version where the kingdom of God is getting whooped, as we would say in Cherokee County? Or is it as the NIV says, the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing? Well, here's what's interesting. Jesus said it in a way that it could be interpreted either way. 
It could be interpreted either passive voice or middle voice. If it's passive voice, it means the kingdom of God is suffering violence. It's getting whipped. If it's middle voice, it means we're the one that's doing the fighting, so we're doing the whipping. So how do you know which is right? Well, that's why Jesus put this last part, and the violent take it by force. And what he's telling you is, if you're more violent, then the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing. But if you are not the more violent, but the demons are, you're taking a whipping. And many of you are taking a whipping. And the reason you're taking a whipping is because you can't stand against the wiles of the devil. You do real good for a while. And then all of a sudden, it's like all hell broke loose. The car quit working. The refrigerator went out. All of a sudden, the plumbing broke and your house flooded and you don't know what to do. You don't have any savings. You can't get your money back from the deposit you put down to go on that vacation. And then you're going to have to go to mom and dad and ask for a loan. And they're on a fixed income because they're retired. What in the world happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. You're not strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. All your strength lies within you, not outside of you. Your strength should be in the Lord and in the power of his might because you put on the armor of God. And when you put on the armor of God, you're able to stand. Now that means you don't give ground, but not only does it not mean you give ground, it also means that when you're taking that, you get mad and you go on the offensive. You counterattack. You start praying the word of God. You start coming in and exercising your faith. And you take it directly to him. And the most violent take it by force. That's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 verse 11. That's what he was trying to tell us. So here he tells us that we, if we'll put on the armor of God, will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now again, look back at verse 11. And this time I want you to notice what we're standing against. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, according to Paul, we're supposed to stand against the wiles of the devil. Underline that word wiles. Wiles is translated from the Greek word methodia. And methodia refers to a regular, systematic way of doing something. In fact, our English word, method, is transliterated from this Greek word. So, methodia literally means method. It's that certain systematic way we have of doing something. We all have our own method for doing things. You know, when I want to help Lisa and I load the dishwasher, I've noticed that after I load it, she comes back and she rearranges everything. You want to know why she rearranges everything? Because I'm not doing it according to her method. If I fold clothes... I'm not going to do it the way she does it. So she will probably refold the clothes. Women, that's why us men never do things for you. Because we can't please you. Right? It's not the way you do things. But that's what the word methodia means. It's a certain systematic way of doing things. So what Paul is telling us is that the devil has certain methods that he uses when he attacks. Yeah. He has a certain systematic way of doing things. And if you want to know what those methods are, then you need to study the different names of Lucifer in the Bible. Because each name describes something about Lucifer, such as what he is, or what he's like, or how he operates. In fact, these different names for Lucifer are what we would call nicknames. They're nicknames that God has given him. But more importantly, they describe something about him. They're descriptors. But that's what a nickname is. Usually a nickname does that. A nickname describes something about the person, some type of characteristic or what they do. If you're short, you might get the nickname Shorty. If you don't use deodorant, you're probably going to get the nickname Stinker or Smelly, right? Yeah. Well, God has given Lucifer nicknames that describe something about him, such as what he is. He's a liar. He's a murderer. Or what he's like. He's a roaring lion. Lion. He's a serpent. Or how he operates. He's a deceiver. He's an accuser. But the point I'm trying to make is this. The devil has certain methods that he uses when he attacks us. And if you want to know what those methods are, then you need to study the different names of Lucifer in the Bible. And people, there are many. So let me give you just a few of those names. 
He's referred to as Abaddon in Revelation 9-11. The accuser in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. The adversary in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. He's also referred to as an angel of light in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 14. How does he do that, Pastor Allen? We'll just study Mormonism. Joseph Smith had this revelation from this angel named Moroni. Moroni came and appeared to him. And he showed him where these golden tablets would be. And so from that revelation from this angel named Moroni, he gets this new revelation. Christianity is all wrong. Jesus is not the Son of God. He's not deity. And so he creates this whole religion. But it comes from an angel of light. And that's why I say, and I don't mean this in a bad way, I know several Mormons and they're good people, but I want you to understand, that's a demonic religion. Islam is a demonic religion. Yeah. Muhammad is in this cave. Something grabs him, squeezes him, and says, recite. Actually, it tells him to read, and he's illiterate. And he barely goes, I can't. He throws him down. He picks him up again, squeezes him, and says, he says, read, and he can't do it. Finally, he tells him to recite. And he begins to recite, and he gives the Quran. It's a demonic religion. It came from, quote, an angel of light. I want you to understand something. The Bible didn't come from angels. It's God breathed. There are angels in the Bible that came and maybe announced something, but the Bible records that. The Bible is the inspired word of God. It's God breathed. It says apostles and prophets mo were moved by the Holy Spirit and wrote these things. And it doesn't take much to be able to study the Bible and see how it all fits together. These different books over a thousand year period put them all together and it just blows your mind of how it all fits together he's also called Apollyon in Revelation chapter 9 verse 11 Beelzebub Matthew chapter 10 verse 25 Belial 2 Corinthians 6 15 devil Ephesians 6 11 his name is not devil his name is not devil that is a descriptor his name is Lucifer Devil, devil is the Greek word diabolos. It's a compound word. It's made up of two words. The prefix dia, which means through, and balo, which means to throw. When you combine these, it means to throw through. And literally what it means is to throw something at a wall or at a person until you break through. And that's one of the methods of the devil. He continually throw things at you until you find out, I just can't take it anymore. I'm giving up. And you don't come back to church for a while. And you don't read your Bible and you don't pray. You just too beat up. Yeah, he worked. That's the devil. But that's not his name. That's his nickname. His name's Lucifer. Dragon in Revelation 12, 9. Evil one in Matthew 6, 13. Murderer in John 8, 44. Prince of the world. Of this world in John 12, 31. And yes, he is the prince of this world. Okay, I got to move on. Prince of demons, Matthew 9, 34. Prince of the power of the air, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. He's a roaring lion in 1 Peter 5, 8. He's Satan in Luke 10, 18. And no, Satan is not his name. Well, I thought Lucifer was his first name and Satan was his surname. No, it's not Lucifer, Satan. No, Satan is a descriptor. Lucifer is his name. And then serpent. People, that's just a few of his names. That's not all of them. Now listen to me, because this is very important. And this isn't coming on the board. You just need to hear me. All of these nicknames can be divided into four categories. Let me say it again. All of these nicknames can be divided into four categories. Nicknames that describe Lucifer's destructive bent. He's a murderer. Jesus said the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. So the first category are the nicknames that describe Lucifer's destructive bent. Secondly, Nicknames that describe Lucifer's perverted nature. He's a pervert. All of the sexual sins that you see, all of the perversions, let me tell you, there is a demonic spirit behind all those. I should say spirits. Jesus referred to them as unclean spirits. You have to understand Greek to understand what he's talking about. It means filthy spirits. It's those type of spirits that cause all this perversion that you see in the world today. Third category, nicknames that describe Lucifer's desire to control. He is a manipulator and a controller. He wanted to take his throne above God. He wants to be 
the one. And he wants to manipulate and he, can, he wants to control. And some of you know people who are manipulators and controllers. Let me explain something about them. They're oppressed by certain demons that want to manipulate and control. They can't stand it when they're not. I won't go into that, but you can do a deeper study. And then last but not least, there are nicknames that describe Lucifer's methods of attack. Now, it's in this last category that you really need to study because once you understand how the devil operates, once you understand how he attacks, then you're more prepared to not only endure it, but to counterattack. Now, I'm getting off track, so we want to get back to the series. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Paul told us what we need to do. We need to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, not in our own strength and the supernatural power of Jesus, right? And in verse 11, he told us how to do that. We become strong in the Lord and in the power of his might when we put on the whole armor of God because it's kind of like an Iron Man suit. When it's on, you're strong in the Lord. When it's off, you're not. You see, the supernatural, or I should say the armor of God gives us supernatural strength. When it's on, we have the supernatural power of Jesus. When it's off, we don't. Now, verse 12 tells us why we need to be strong in the Lord by putting on the armor of God. Look at verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now, you see that word for? For is translated from the Greek word hati. Yeah, like... My wife is a hottie, all right? Hati. But more importantly, it's a causal conjunction. It should have been translated because. See, we don't understand this because in the King James Version, for back then in 1611 actually meant because. So you see all these fours in the King James Version. Literally, it means because. You guys want a little interesting fact? I'll give you a little interesting fact. James I was the the king who actually had the King James Bible written. How many of you know that he was a flaming homosexual? Yeah. Well, thank the Lord, he, didn't, he wasn't the one to translate. He just had him translate it because he's trying to please. But wonderful translation. I love the King James Version. The reason I love the King James Version is because it's closer to the original translation or the original Greek, I'm sorry. It's closer to the original Greek than all the other translations. The problem is we just don't talk like that anymore. But this word, haughty, should be because. So he tells us why we should put on the armor of God. Why we need to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Here's why. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So the reason we need to be strong in the Lord by putting on the armor of God is because we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. So it doesn't matter how strong we are physically. It doesn't matter how much you bench press. It doesn't matter how much you deadlift. It doesn't matter how much you squat or clean and jerk. Let me tell you, you can be the strongest, most fit person in the world, and it does you absolutely no good. In fact, in another place of Scripture, Paul says, bodily exercise profiteth little. Now, I'm glad he said little. Because it does, pro it does profit us. We can become, and this is one of the sins of the church, and I, many times I fall into it, obesity. And you know, this is the temple of the Holy Spirit, so God does want us to be healthy. But one of the things Paul wants us to understand is bodily exercise profits is little. Why little? Because it only helps you when you're on this earth. So it's temporal. What really benefits you is righteousness. What really benefits you is being strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That's what matters. Because what we are fighting operates in the spiritual realm, not the physical realm. That's why I love praying grandmothers. How I many had a praying grandmother? And you think, man, I'm telling you, in the Lord, they're strong. And you look at them, and they're weak, and they're frail. And my granny Riddell, she had Parkinson's. And so she got the mask. How many know what the mask is? The mask is, can't come out with the mouth, just falls open. My mom got it later on. And so they had the mask, and my granny's head would shake. But let me tell you, my granny Riddell knew how to pray. And though she looked weak and frail, she was strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. But the reason she was strong is because what we war against 
is not flesh and blood. It's not in this physical realm. What we war against is spiritual. Some of you can't understand why you went and got your college degree, maybe a, a graduate degree, you have a great job. Everything should be going great for you, but your life is a mess. Do you want to know why? It's because we don't just wrestle with flesh and blood. We don't have to overcome. Or it's not just us overcoming in the physical. There's these spiritual things. And these spiritual things are wrecking havoc in your home, with your children, with your marriage, in your finances. And the problem is, you're trying to fight it on your own. You can't do that. You see, we're fighting against principalities, against powers, against rulers of this darkness, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. And if you don't have on the whole armor of God, then you're not going to be able to stand. And people, you, you will fall. It's not a matter of if you will fall. It's a matter of when you will fall and how big your fall will be. I've seen people who have succeeded in the physical world and they lose their marriage or they lose their children. And you look at them and they'll tell you, I thought I had everything under control. But the one thing they didn't understand is we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. So the secret to success all goes back to the armor of God. When the armor of God is on, you're a spiritual beast. You're like Iron Man in the spiritual realm. When it's off, you are a weak, frail, sniveling human being and ill-equipped to fight spiritual forces. So over the next few weeks, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be talking about the armor of God. And we're going to be looking at each piece because each piece has a specific purpose. So if you don't put on the whole armor of God, you might put on certain pieces, you're still going to fall because pretty soon, Lucifer and his demons are going to see what you don't have on and that's where they're going to attack you. Would you like an example? The breastplate is the breastplate of what? Righteousness. Righteousness. And what does it guard? It guards the heart. You can have the sword of the spirit. You can have the helmet of salvation. You can have the shield of faith. But if you don't have righteousness, you might experience a moral failure. The devil knows what you have on and what you don't have on. He knows where you're susceptible and where you're not. So over the next few weeks, I'm going to come in and begin teaching on the armor of God, and you don't want to miss it. If you want to know how to be victorious in the spiritual realm, I will show you. Paul gives us the secret.